Well, let's dive into the Word today. I, I hope that if you can go, I, my daughter reminds me of this. We have a, an ability through our, our uh, uh, app at the church. You can actually get the outline. All the blanks are already filled in for you for that. If you haven't done that, you can go to that app and, and do that this morning. But we started the series of messages a few weeks ago based on a story that I told you about a time when I went to spend the night with my mother recently. And we were just talking about ways that she had cut back on some things that they, she didn't do anymore because my dad's death back in February, as you know, a year ago. And she mentioned that she didn't take the newspaper anymore because the only reason they ever took the newspaper is because my father loved to do the crossword puzzle, and that was really the only reason they did that. And I told you this several weeks later, I was driving home late one night after an elders meeting in the church, and somehow that story came to my mind, and I started remembering that word crossword, and I just wondered, what are some words that describe the cross for us? And so I, I literally went home that night, it was at past midnight, and took a piece of paper out and wrote down some of those words. And over these weeks, I just want to share with you what God put on my heart. And maybe there will be the same words that you think about. If you remember several weeks ago, the first word that came to my mind was sacrifice. What Jesus did on the cross for us was certainly the greatest sacrifice ever. And last week, we came together and talked about a word that we love to talk about because it is the great word, the word love. Jesus came, obviously, to seek and save the lost because He loved us, that agape love, that love that, that loves us despite who we are, even though we're sinners by nature and by choice. And so today I want to come talk about a word, obviously, where it's Easter Sunday, and the word that comes to my mind today is the word victory, a celebration. That's what this is. It's a victory. And I think about my own life, and many, many moons ago, I was actually a pretty decent little athlete, and, and I've, I've, in my life, I know what it's like to have the agony of defeat. I remember many years sitting on the bench wishing I could play in, in basketball and not getting to play and how agonizing that was. And a sport that I excelled at was golf. And I remember a time when I was in the, in the 11th grade, I beat the number two ranked guy in the entire state of Tennessee. I know what victory's like as well, and there's nothing like victory. I remember my father coming home from the 1980 Olympics. He was our, his company sponsored the Olympics. And you remember something really spectacular happened. It was February 22nd of 1980 the U.S. hockey team beat the Russian team. It's perhaps the greatest upset in all of history. It was a great victory for a nation that we've never gotten over. We love victory, but all those things, in fact, every victory there's ever been in the world since it began doesn't even measure up to the greatest victory of all. That's when Jesus won the great victory on the cross for you and me. Well, there's a great passage of Scripture that we could turn to this morning. It's actually in 1 Corinthians. And let me just read a couple of the verses for you, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. It's really a Mount Everest Scripture that we have. We read these words, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Verse 3 says this, For I deliver to you as of first importance what also I received, that Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And then skipping toward the end of this incredible passage in verses 56 and 57, it's crowned with these words, The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But listen to this. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That great, great victory. Jesus won a victory on Calvary that's greater than any victory that will ever be won, obviously. So let's talk about this little outline that I've given you today. The first thing that this text te tell, told me was about the setting around which this took place. Notice the setting. It was mentioned, if you remember, in verses 3 and 4, it says, For I deliver to you as of first importance what also I received, that Christ died for your sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Three simple things, if I can share them with you real quickly. Real straightforward. Number one, someone had to die. The Bible says there's no remission of sin without death. It has to be blood. There had to be someone who would die. The scripture said in verse 3, For I delivered to you as a first importance that I also, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Somebody had to die. 
And that somebody was Jesus. The second thing, not just somebody had to die, someone had to be buried. In verse 4 it says and that he was buried. Jesus was graveyard dead. He was absolutely dead and he was buried. Lots of rumors were around that Jesus really was in a state of shock after the cross and he never was really dead. The Bible predicted 800 years before Jesus would come that Jesus would live, he would die, he would be buried. And the last thing, obviously, somebody had to rise. And the text goes on to say in verse 4, it says that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now listen one more time. Somebody had to die. Somebody had to be buried. And somebody had to come out of that grave. Somebody had to rise. And I submit to you there's only one person in all of human history that could ever do those three things. Lots of people die. Lots of people are buried. In fact, every so-called God there's ever been lived and perhaps died, but only one could be resurrected. His name is Jesus. And so this is the greatest victory that's ever won, and it started with the setting. The setting was, again, somebody had to die, somebody had to be buried, and only one, Jesus, could actually be resurrected. Only one could rise. And so that's the setting behind this victory. The second thing I noticed was the source of the victory. And if you go back to that text I read just a moment ago in verse 57, it said this, but thanks be to God. He is the source behind this. In fact, you know this verse well. We talked about it last week. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let me go back to that one more time. Again, for God so loved the world. The text says again, but thanks be to God. Only our God loved you and loved me so much that despite our sin, despite the fact we could never deserve it or earn it, our Jesus was willing to die. He was willing to send Jesus to die for us. And it reminds me, a lot of people, I meet people from time to time that say, I can go out in nature and worship God. And what they're really doing is they're worshiping the creation instead of the creator. And I want to make sure you focus on the right thing here. And I, I put these words in my notes. Never forget that the blesser is greater than the blessing. Don't just worship the blessing and be thankful for the blessing. Be thankful for the blesser. It says for God. He's the source. If God had not been willing to do this, there is no redemption. There is no hope. There is no salvation. And so the source of this victory is so important. That source is God. For God so loved the world. And again, thanks be to God. The third thing I thought about this morning that I think is really important as well is not again, not just the setting, not just the source, but think about this. Think about the surprise. Here's the surprise of this great victory. It says, but thanks be to God. You ready for this? Who gives us the victory. Here's the great surprise. It's free. Are you ready for this? It's free. God gives us this salvation. I, I remember in Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9, very famous verses Again, just remember this, for we are saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. Listen, it's the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. For we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which he preordained to do for us. And so again, for by grace you're saved through faith and that not of yourself. You ready? It's the gift of God. Here's the surprise of this victory. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. It's a gift. God gives us the free gift of salvation. What an amazing thought. And so don't be surprised by this, but it is a surprise. You can't earn this. You can't buy it. It's a gift. God loves you so much that He gave His only begotten Son that He might give us salvation. He didn't make us earn it. We can't earn it. We will never deserve it. We can't be good enough. He gives it to us. Praise God on especially this day that again, he was, he was killed, he was buried, but he was resurrected and he did that so he might give you this free gift of salvation. So the surprise of the victory. And then finally, notice the sufficiency of this victory. And finally in verse 57 again, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The sufficiency. Hey, if salvation is dependent upon how good I can be, I don't want it. If it's based upon how good you are, sorry, I don't want it. If it's based upon how good anybody can be, we don't want it. The sufficiency of our salvation and this victory is who did it. Again, we're saved not because we're good. We're saved because He's good. We're not saved because we do great things. We're saved because He did great things. In fact, He was the perfect Savior. So it's through our Lord Jesus Christ that we're saved. Listen to this verse. This is in 2 Peter 
chapter 1, verse 3. Listen clearly. Seeing that His divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. Jesus is the reason that we're saved, not because we're good. It's not anything that we could ever do. In fact, He says it's a free gift only to those who would come to Him in the free pardon of sin. And so let me just say this to you. This is the greatest day. It's the greatest victory there'll ever be. All the victories combined can't touch this victory. Jesus won a victory on Calvary so long ago, 2,000 years ago, that the world has not gotten over and it never will. And no uh, virus, no anything this world can throw at us can take away this, this victory because this victory takes away the sting of death. And so I want to say to you, I want to make sure you know this. We're available to you. There's nothing I'd rather do in this whole world than talk to somebody about their salvation. I want to remind you the greatest victory there'll ever be was earned on, on, uh, on Calvary by Jesus for you and me. Somebody again had to die. Somebody had to be buried and somebody had to be resurrected. Only Jesus, only Jesus could do all three of those things and He did it for you. If I can help you in any way, I think they're going to put actually up on the screen my cell phone number. I'd rather talk to you about that than anything in the world. Please know this. Jesus loves you. He died for you. And if you throw yourself upon His mercy and ask Him to forgive you of your sin, to wash that sin away, and to save your soul, I promise you, He'll do exactly that. Well, I'd love to pray for you. And I want to remind you as we do this, this is a time to start making preparation for the Lord's Supper. Most of you know me very well. And I think the preparation for this is so important. If you're not willing to ask God to search you and to find any wickedness within you and remove that from your life, I'd ask you not to participate in this. And so even as I pray, would you pray? Would you pray for your family and for you individually that you would just be open before God that if there's anything in your life that needs to be removed, that He would remove it. So as we prepare for this time around the Lord's table, preparing where you are and preparing here, that we'd be prepared for that. Again, if we can help you in any way, there's nothing I'd rather do than talk to you about salvation. Let's pray together. Well, Father, I am so thankful for what you've done for us. None of us could ever deserve it, Lord. We are reminded of the setting of Calvary, Father, the, the beating that you took for us. Father, somebody had to die and you were that somebody. Somebody had to be buried and that was you. But only you, only you could have been resurrected. Thank you for the source who is God who loved us so much that he sent his only son, God, into this world. And we've never gotten over it, God. We don't want to get over that. I thank you, God, that you love us so much that you would sacrifice your very life for us. Thank you for doing that, God. Thank you for the surprise. The surprise is you did this for free. You're, you're not requiring anything of us except, for God, that we would repent, that we would confess our sin. And so thank you, God, for giving us something we could never earn or ever deserve. And thank you that you're sufficient for this, God. Only you could do this. There's only one Jesus. There's only one who could be resurrected, and that's you. And so, God, I pray for every person who can hear my voice that, God, they would open their heart to you and be sure of their salvation. And now, God, as we prepare for the Lord's table with our families, a special time, God, there's nothing we do this side of heaven more particular or more special than gathering around the Lord's table, remembering, God, your sacrifice for us. And as we do this, God, we confess our sin before you. We ask you to wash us and make us clean, God, so that we can partake of the Lord's table in an appropriate manner. We love you so much for this. Thank you, God, for your sacrifice. Thank you for your love. And thank you for this time we could remember it in such a special way. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, here at my house, I'm leaving my den and heading to the kitchen, and I hope at your house you're preparing as well. We've prepared the elements here for us, and even for the crew of people here with us, I hope you'll do exactly the same. And So uh, gather with your family. Gentlemen, if you have the privilege to be a dad and you have your family there, pray with your family. Make this appropriate to you, but I want to lead us through this. My whole family's gathering with me here in the kitchen. I'm going to sit at my kitchen table and, and lead you through this, but again, I want you to do what... God leads you to do. What a special time this is for us to do this with our families today. And so my crew's gathering here with me, and, and I hope that you're gathering together as well. What a special time for us, even though we're divided, to have this time with the Lord. Well, let me read something. You hear me read this often, but it's all right from the Scriptures, obviously. We're 
are going to take this time to gather around the Lord's table. You remember that at the end of Jesus' time here on this earth, he gathered with the ones that were most special to him for one last opportunity to remind them what he was fixing to do. He was going to lay his life down for the sins of this world. It's amazing they had walked with him and talked with him and heard all the sermons and seen all the miracles. But we know that even at the end there, they still didn't fully get it. But that night, they got it. No one left that room, that upper room, without fully understanding what Jesus was fixing to do. And so scripture tells us this again, we're now to come to observe the ordinance of the Lord's Supper that was given to us to celebrate the memory of his broken body and his shed blood. It said that on the night before he was betrayed at the conclusion of the feast of the Passover that he and his disciples were taking, he took bread and having blessed it, he broke it or broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body which is given for you. And I'll ask you where you are and I'll ask my family to come and just gather around here and grab one of these, if you will. There you go. And just a symbol of what Jesus did for you and for me. And here at our house, we just have some saltine crackers. I'm sure where you are, you could find something that's appropriate. But again, the Bible says that he took this and he broke it and he gave his disciples and said, this is my body which is given for you. And so would you pray with me? God, we thank you for the broken body of Jesus. We're so thankful, Lord, for his sacrifice for us. Truly today, there is no victory without you. So God, you laid your life down for us through your son, Jesus. And today we want you to know, Father, how much we appreciate and love you for that. Again, we realize we have no hope without you. And so thank you for being willing, Father, to ha have your body broken so that, God, we could have victory. In Christ's name, amen. And the eight. The Bible goes on to tell us this, that after the supper, he gave, he, he uh, obviously gave the fruit of the vine as well. And uh, it says on that night he took the cup and having blessed it, he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my blood which is shed for you. And again, this is a symbolism. This isn't Jesus' actual blood. It's a reminder to us that Jesus was willing to sacrifice his very blood. And the Bible tells us there is no remission of sin without it. And so I'm going to let my family all gather here and get a cup and make sure all the folks here in the room have that before we press forward. Scripture goes on to tell us this, and according to the law, I may almost say that all things are cleansed with blood, and apart from the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Again, if Jesus had not been willing to die, to be buried, and be resurrected, we'd have no hope. It's the very blood of Calvary that we celebrate today because that blood still cleanses us from all sin, and they drank. We'll end with these words today, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us. You ready for this? From all sin. Wow. For as often as you take this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Here's the great promise. Until he comes. And one day he is coming. We celebrate his broken body, his shed blood today. And we're thankful of the promise that Jesus one day is going to come receive us to himself. Church family, we love you. This has been special to be with my family today. I miss you so much. I can't wait till we can be back together. Continue to pray for us as we pray for you. Thank you for your amazing support. You're the most amazing church there is. Thank you for joining us today. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful Easter season. Amen. Amen.